Hello everybody, welcome back to the Calgary Guide video series. Today we're focusing on the pathogenesis, complications, and clinical findings of cardiogenic shock. Once again, please support us in our work by liking this video just as it's starting out and by subscribing to my channel. Thanks in advance. Now cardiogenic shock is different from obstructive shock because whereas in obstructive shock, blood is prevented from entering the heart, in cardiogenic shock, the heart receives a normal volume of blood but simply can't pump it out. And that's because of four main reasons. Cardiac arrhythmia, cardiac valve dysfunction, cardiomyopathies, and myocardial infarctions. Now there are Calgary Guide slides for each of these four main causes of cardiogenic shock, so I encourage you to check them out. First, cardiac arrhythmia can involve a severe bradycardia, which means a reduced heart rate, which by definition leads to reduced cardiac output. Cardiac arrhythmias can also involve severe tachycardias, which reduces the time the heart spends in diastole, and therefore reduces the time for the left ventricle to fill, resulting in reduced stroke volume, or the amount of blood the heart is able to pump forward into the arteries, which results in reduced cardiac output. Second, cardiac valve dysfunction. Valvular regurgitation means that in systole, when the ventricles are contracting, some blood goes backwards, reducing the stroke volume and reducing cardiac output. With valvular stenosis, the forward flow of blood is obstructed, which reduces stroke volume and reduces cardiac output. The third group of causes is cardiomyopathies. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, like valvular stenosis, the forward flow of blood is obstructed, reducing stroke volume and reducing cardiac output. In other cardiomyopathies, myocyte destruction or loss results in reduced cardiac contractility, which is basically the ability of ventricles to push blood forward when they contract. This results in reduced stroke volume and reduced cardiac output. Finally, myocardial infarction, meaning the death of cardiac muscle, by definition reduces cardiac contractility, reducing stroke volume, and reducing cardiac output. Now, in a state of reduced cardiac output, because blood pressure depends on cardiac output, that results in reduced blood pressure. Further, with reduced cardiac output, there's going to be a buildup of blood and pressure in the venous system. So the blood from the right ventricle backs up into the right atrium and the superior vena cava. And that results in the blood backing up into the jugular veins of the patient, increasing the patient's JVP, jugular venous pressure. Increased hydrostatic pressure in the peripheral veins also means that fluid will be pushed out of those veins, leading to peripheral edema. Blood from the left ventricle also backs up into the lungs, resulting in increased pulmonary blood pressure, which can be measured as pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, resulting in pulmonary edema, which results in dyspnea, shortness of breath, and tachypnea, an increased breath rate. The heart tries to compensate for this reduced cardiac output by increasing the heart rate, which leads to tachycardia. And insufficient organ perfusion is reflected in the skin, brain, heart, and kidneys. In the skin, because the body preferentially vasoconstricts the extremities to preserve blood and warmth to key vital organs, and because arterial blood is red and venous blood tends to be blue, and there's reduced arterial blood and increased venous blood in the skin, that results in cold, pale, or mottled extremities. In the brain, reduced cerebral blood flow results in cerebral hypoxia, leading to the patient having progressively decreasing level of consciousness. In the heart, reduced coronary perfusion leads to myocardial ischemia, or if severe, can result in a type of cardiac arrest known as pulseless electrical activity. And finally, in the kidneys, reduced blood flow to the kidneys leads to renal ischemia, resulting in a type of acute kidney injury called acute tubular necrosis. And finally, reduced blood flow to the kidneys is by definition known as reduced glomerular filtration rate, which can be measured by an increased amount of serum creatinine and also a reduced amount of urine produced by the patient, otherwise known as oliguria. And that's it for a summary of the pathogenesis, complications, and clinical findings of cardiogenic shock. If you found this slide useful, please support us in our work by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. Thanks, and see you in the next video.